Before I get started, though, I want to take a couple seconds to thank the Linux Laser Company for having me here today and putting all this together. One of my responsibilities at Delaware County Community College is I'm the art gallery director as well. And I know that something like this doesn't go off without a lot of work and involvement in, involved in it. Um, you know, we come, we sit down, we have a little donut here and there, and it, everything's wonderful. But before all this can take place, there's a lot of people's hands involved. So I just want to thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. Okay. Um, me and my photography. Uh, I've been involved in photography for, I guess, four decades now. And I have uh, uh, studied in the school of the uh, uh, West Coast photography tradition. For those of you who are not familiar with that, that is a group that was formed called F64. And their whole idea uh, behind photography was to separate themselves from uh, the painterly aspect and uh, to become more of an art, art uh, form under its own. And with that in mind, uh, everything had to be sharp and crisp and clear, and hence the number is 64 because that was an f-stop that was used to take pictures with the view camera. Um, I don't know if I can get this done successfully here. Uh, do I just touch? Oh, there you go. I'm a Mac person, you know, and so uh, uh, my cold dead hands. <laughs> and so what I want to do is I know Chris had this set up on the... Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm getting there. All right. There's a little pin here. A little pin. How's that? All right. That's good. Is that doing its thing? Oh, it was doing its thing. There we go. All right. Okay. So what I want to show you first, or what's going to be shown first, is basically where I came, came from is before I got involved with pinhole photography. Uh, these, I'm a, a large format photographer, and I work in black and white almost exclusively. And I use, again, view cameras. With you, for those who aren't familiar with that, that's where you put a dark cloth over your head, and the image is upside down reverse, uh, zone system, all this fiddling and whittling and all this. Uh, but uh, takes 23 steps to take a picture with a view camera. Um, sometimes it gets very heavy depending on how much stuff you carry. I try to keep it as light as possible. I worked um, in the past, even though I've moved on down the areas, I've worked in the past with theme oriented or project oriented. So what you're looking at are images um, from various portfolios that I've produced over the years. Over the past few years, uh, I've started to feel like I needed some sort of a change. Uh, I didn't know what that change was. Uh, I wasn't sure where I was going with that change, but I felt as though I needed it. I didn't necessarily want to buy, uh, you know, a bigger view camera because I, you know, I know view cameras are coming out of my ears. Uh, but I didn't want it to be. I still love the landscape, and I still love some of the other, you know, architectural things that I'm involved with. But I was looking for something different from my work. Before I get go any further, I have to apologize to all the pinhole enthusiasts, because. Really? I didn't think that much of pinhole photography. I didn't know. I, I just didn't know. I mean, you know, so last year at Christmas time, uh, I was given a present by my office mate and, and uh, art gallery uh, assistant, director. And she gave me one of these kits that are uh, designed to make a pinhole camera in the form of a 35 millimeter SLR. I have pretty big hands, but I'm pretty, pretty crafty. I can handle things pretty well. So during the Christmas holidays, I put this, diligently put this thing together, and when the first opportunity where the weather broke, I went out to use it. Well, I took about two shots and the thing literally fell apart in my hands. I mean, the film got exposed, or, you know, the, the separated, it was a mess. And I had this brand new toy that didn't work. And probably if it had worked, I'd have probably dismissed it as, well, you know, pinhole photography being this kind of uh, fuzzy picture kind of thing and, and going with that. But because it didn't work, I got very, very excited about and, and sort of upset about the fact of really what's going on with this. I need to know, you know, it didn't work. I got a new toy and it, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. So I got on the net and I started doing some research. And boy, was I wrong. So that's why I apologize straight up. I was really, really, really misinformed about what pinhole photography was all about. 
Uh, and so the more I researched, the more information I found, and the more excited I got, I thought, well, you know, maybe this isn't, uh, maybe this isn't what you thought. Maybe you ought to give it a, a shot. So at uh, my birthday is in January, and what I decided to do was to order a pinhole camera. This is from the Lensless uh, Camera Company in uh, out of Nevada, and uh, to kind of give it a try. Well, the first three or four times I went out, it was a total absolute disaster. You have to realize, again, I'm used to having control over everything, uh, and I had control over nothing. I can't see. There's no histogram, there's no f-stops, there's no shutter, uh, there's no dark claw. Uh, this, even though this box didn't come like this, it's gone through several incarnations to kind of allow me to kind of do the things that I needed to do. And the more I researched, the more I realized that uh, the pinhole in it wasn't quite right the way it was. And so I started doing, you know, more reading about that and found out that there's supposed to be an optimal distance between the pinhole and the size that you're using. And every site that I went to, uh, Lenox Laser came up with a thing as one of the places to kind of get your pinhole from. I mean, there are other people, but they kept coming up repeatedly over and over and over and over again. These people must know what they're doing because they're keep showing up. So I gave a call, I talked to Joe, I talked to uh, Rachel. And we started working together, and their uh, pinhole is in this camera. This is a 5x7 uh, uh, pinhole camera. It's 200 millimeters in length, uh, and the pinhole that's inside here is a 650 micron. I'm used to milliliters, but I, it's a whole new language I've had to learn to understand. Uh, micron. And uh, when uh, I've had some uh, wonderful uh, uh, experiences with this, some scary experiences, with this as well, as again, because I can't see, and uh, I've had to adapt uh, and really trust in in myself and my experience as a photographer when I go out to photograph to kind of get the images that I want. Uh, so, what you're going to see next is the results of a lot of hard work and a lot of patience and a lot of giving up of all the things that you're used to dealing with and thinking about the whole process in a completely different way. Uh, and this next series of slides uh, I'm going to show you are from uh, what I've done recently using this camera and that pinhole. Let's see if we can get out of here and do this again. No. Yeah. I don't know where to go to from here. I'm lost. Where's my Mac? I just went. I closed one, and I wanted to open the second one. I did. I did that one. I wanted to do this one. since January. So January I've been on this tear, on this, uh, I'm obsessed, I don't know if that's a good word or not, but I am, uh, about this whole process of uh, pinhole photography. And uh, these are, this first set of series are locally in my area uh, using uh, this camera. And uh, I have uh, continued to grow as far as understanding how the exposure grows and how the seeing process works with this, uh, and I just designed another uh, uh, 4x5 model myself, this one was commercial, but I built one myself, 
and hopefully uh, this weekend for a worldwide pinhole day, I'm going to get a chance to get out and test it. Uh, one of the things that I've learned from this process, again, like I said earlier, is that you really have to kind of let go, and you have to know your craft as a photographer. Uh, I always believe that photography is a science, a craft, and an art form in that order. You have to understand some of the science. You have to continue to practice the craft with great efficiency. And then and only then can you be artistic. That's what I try and relate to my students. And uh, what I have learned from this is that over the years, although this is completely a different avenue for me, uh, the discipline involved with the view camera has passed down to working with this. Except that this is a lot freer on one hand. On the other hand, there's a tremendous amount of science involved as far as formulas and exposures and all that kind of stuff. But it's a lot freer to allow you to be able to see and create when you're out photographing. And it's just absolutely amazing to me that when I'm out um, uh, with this, uh, how much uh, I can really think about what it is that I want to do and spend the time looking at it. This is the latest thing, last thing that I did. This is from the White Place in New Mexico. Um, and uh, again, it was a phenomenal experience. These were all shot in one day. It was the last day of my trip. Uh, normally with my view camera, I would always take two of everything. I only had 10 holders. So I said, I got to get as much as I possibly can. So I broke my own rule, which I never, no hardly ever do, and that is just walk away with one image. So I had uh, 20 shots that I took, and uh, 11 of these I decided to use out of this series. Um, so uh, the, the experience for me goes on as far as uh, when I think about the amount of equipment that I have at home that's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars uh, involved with new camera equipment. And here we have this little box uh, with a hole in it and uh, three or six uh, push pins because I put these push pins in myself so I can see. Uh, at the top to help me guide my way through it. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, there is something that I want to read uh, with you, to you, uh, and then I'll take questions of any type that you might have. And as I think about what I'm doing at this point in time, I say, well, how does this fit into, you know, the, the rest of my photography? And where is this, where is this going? Um, I'm not sure where it's going. All I know at this point in time is I'm enjoying the ride, and it's absolutely wonderful. It's a great learning experience. Uh, I've had uh, friends of mine and students say, well, why, why are you messing around with pinhole photography when, you know, we've got all this digital stuff available to us? I teach uh, three separate digital courses as well as uh, traditional darkroom courses. Uh, and, you know, there's all the stuff that's involved with that that will drive you absolutely crazy. And as I thought about it, I had a difficult time trying to answer that question myself. And I came across this site. It's from Phenon. I guess it's F-I-N-D-O-N. And the, uh, the uh, uh, poster of the site is uh, R.D. Hughes. And this statement kind of embodies the, what I feel or the way I feel about photography, photography with pinhole. And he says, why pinhole photography? I struggle to find an adequate explanation, however, after some reflection, I offer the following explanation. He says, I find pinhole photography can be absorbing, affordable, alluring, artistic, begalving, bewitching, captivating, challenging, charming, compelling, compulsive, delightful, different, enchanting, entrancing, engaging, engrossing, Enraptive, enrapturing, rather, I'm sorry, enthralling, expensive, experimental, fascinating, fun, gripping, inexpensive, irresistible, intriguing, magical, riveting, spellbinding, uncommon, unusual, scientific, simple, time consuming, and unique, but not all necessarily in the same order. <laughs> this answers how I feel about pinhole photography at this point in time. This is, this is exactly where I'm at. Um, I'll take any questions you might have about my technique, my approach to it, what I do, and think what I'm talking about. Yeah. Are you doing, so are you doing zone system with pinhole? Am I doing what now? Are you able to do zone system? I tried it once. 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, I with some some of these with the uh, with white place, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little scary because uh, you know. Beautiful. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and filters as well. This mm -hmm. that one in particular has been filled in with our orange filter. I have not used a polarizer filter because I'm afraid it will bend the rays of light. And I don't know what kind of effects I'm going to get with that yet. But this, because usually I stack filters. When I do use uh, lenses, I'll use a polarizer and an orange, or a polarizer and a yellow, or a polarizer and a red. You know, I always use a polarizer to take off the harsh, harsh reflections and then uh, another for contrast. So uh, when I was out in uh, New Mexico, I decided I was going to try these lenses and see whether, just with one, though, I didn't want to, you know. So now we'll go back and we'll experiment a little bit more. Questions? Yeah. How does a layperson tell from looking at a photograph whether or not it's a pinhole pho photograph or an ordinary photograph? That's a good question. Pinhole photography is just a little bit softer than a uh, photograph that's made with a lens. Uh, the advantage that I like so much is that you get tremendous depth of field from ground zero to infinity. And when you work with my experiences with working with view cameras, with the dark cloth over here, over there. there's all these controls that you have to go through to try and achieve that. Strokes, swings, shifts, rises, falls, uh, to try and achieve this, this maximum depth of field because lenses can't, can't handle <coughs> that, that phenomenon because from what I have read, that pinholes don't, you can't focus a pinhole camera. You just have to set the distance for the proper uh, size hole that you have on there. Okay, so the pinhole allows the photograph to have depth. Tremendous depth. When you look at, I mean, this is, I just pointed this at this and said, this is it. I hope it comes out. That's all I can say. And, you know, I've got this tremendous depth of feel in the image. Everyone that I've shown these to are, are, are amazed. I'm amazed. Like I said, I haven't taken a picture with one of my conventional cameras since January. Think about that. That's a long time. I got few cameras lined up saying, "You left me. I'm alone." <laughs> uh, but yes, that's 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 how excited I am about this. Question? Uh, I assume this is done with negatives. Yes, it is. Okay, so a lot of the quality of what you're showing here <clears throat> is your it reflects your skill in the dark room, not somebody's that to go out and click off these pictures. Well, but, you know, that's true, but again, like I said earlier, photography is a science, I believe the craft, craft part, very, very important, and then the art form. Uh, I had a chance to meet Ansel Adams before he died, and one of the things he said, which I thought was a joke when I first, I didn't laugh in the face, but afterwards I kind of laughed at it. He said it takes 15 years to be a photographer, and I thought, ah, 15 years, I was young, I didn't know. Uh, uh, and he said, the first five years, you don't know what you're doing. You're kind of running around, uh, and you're trying to figure out how the bells and whistles work. And in the second five years, you start to kind of get the craft under control. And then in the third part of this, now you have something to say, and you can start to kind of have a vision. And you know what? I found that to be very, very true. It's the time that's invested that's put in that's, that will help a lot. You have to start somewhere. Nobody pops out with a pinhole camera in their hand or <laughs> Digital camera in here and ready to go. You have to start someplace to try and perfect the, the craft, and you have to decide at what level you want to you want to go to. So yeah, this is an equivalent of 44 years worth of of uh, treatment with photography and dedication to photography as far as understanding the, the science of craft, and then being, hopefully being able to be artistic. Question? What kind of film are you using? I'm using at this point uh, for this. Uh, T Max 100, because, uh, uh, and I developed them in HC 110 for seven minutes, uh, and then I scanned them into uh, the computer on a, on a the Mac, Photoshop on a flatbed scanner. Everybody talks about how you have to have a real expensive, uh, this is a 4870, the one that sits in my office at school, uh, scan it in at 1400 DPI, and I would work on them uh, just like I would work on any other print, whether it would be a, a lens or with, you know, a pinhole uh, in a dark room. I, I treat this each image as if I was in the dark room. I don't expect the computer to do something for me that I didn't do when I was out in the field making the image. 
I tell students that all the time, garbage in is still garbage out. So if I, if I, I don't use the, the uh, they have several names, like gray room, light room, whatever. I don't use the digital editing station to try and correct my mistakes. I really try to uh, be disciplined about that. I use it to be creative. Because I'm the biggest hack this side of the papers when I first started out. That's why I figured I, I can fix anything but in Photoshop. Well, that's not necessarily the case. So um, I'm very serious about you know my exposures and the technique in order to be able to, to, to get the results that I want. Well, what, what was your exposure? This is presumably full sun. Yes, uh, that's another thing that I found that's very interesting and that's wonderful. Because as a view camera photographer, I would only photograph really early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Because I'm terrified of the sun, the harsh shadows and all that. Well, with pinhole photography, the sun's your friend. Suddenly you've got this ally because the bright sunlight I have found, that's why I called this series of work from the shadows into the light. There's all this information that I now can get that it would in shadow areas that I, you know, I would have to really fight in the, in with conventional lenses and film in order to hold that. And that's where the, what's interesting is, in, uh, Derek, Derek? Yeah. Yeah, Derek asked me, did I use the zone system? Uh, I, I, only, I only made one negative using the zone system with pinhole. I haven't had to use it otherwise. The, 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 the images that you have seen, the one that was really dark, the dark sky, that was with filtration. That is the only one where I used but the zone system on the bigger exposure. Uh, most of the time, my exposures are in what they call reciprocity phase. Everybody understand how that works or not familiar with that term? Uh, the film is designed to work to give you exposures from 1,000, depending on its ISO, 1,000 to one second. And I'm the one manufacturer that extends that, and that's Fuji Acros. Uh, but once you go past one second, you're in what is known as reciprocity phase. What that means is if I was trained to be a runner, <laughs> and I was running a 100 yard dash and I'm <coughs> something. I'm the fastest 100 yard dash runner in the world. You ask me to run 200 yards, I can do that. But I can't run it at the same speed that I ran 100 yard dash. I need more time to kind of catch that up. That's what happens with reciprocity. After uh, the specs on the film gets to a certain point, it takes longer to record an image. So all these images are in reciprocity. Today. They're done at, uh, started at, uh, 10 and then 22 seconds. I made another one uh, uh, 44 seconds. It would depend on, of course, the lighting situation that I was in at the time. But none of these were done with conventional speeds that you're used to working with for taking pictures with digital cameras or conventional film cameras with lenses. So yeah. cool. One of them was real neat because they were a tree in the background. Right. And you can see the trees Tree blowing. That's right. Yeah, it's really That's right. Good. So, which is another nice thing as well because, again, as a view camera user, People would, you know, they'd see me with this box and I'd be like, they still come up to me like, what is this box? But uh, I would always be concerned about somebody walking in front of the picture. Because I don't want, you know, I don't want people in the picture. Yes. Um, and so that would be a, that would be an issue for me. So I would try and find a, myself standing there waiting for long periods of time for people to kind of get out of the way. I don't have to worry about that. Here, knock yourself out. You want to walk in front of the picture? Go ahead. You know? Because they're not going to show up because of the long exposure times. That I have with the image, so that that's <laughs> so the sunlight's a plus. <coughs> People not in the picture have been plus. You know, it's, it's just one. Any question? No, it's just a time I saw a photo of one of the first photos I was taken in Paris. Okay. There was only one man on the street. Right, but there were probably there were thousands. Thousands, exactly, yes. exactly. That's sort of thing that when the, the, the series of Every images that you saw from uh, uh, New Mexico, the cathedral. Uh, it's a very very famous cathedral downtown in Santa Fe. They were, they were just, that place was just crawling with people. And, and the only thing that showed up in the, in the full frame photograph of that was maybe a car and maybe a ghost of one or two people. So that's one of the really fascinating things that is, it's this whole idea of recording accumulated time. That's what I, how I, I, I equate it to. I don't understand. How can people not show up in a picture? Because they're not, because they're, well, well, there is a ghost because they're not there long enough to make a really permanent impression because your exposure times are so long. You think about the fact that when you're using a digital camera or a film camera, you're making exposures at a fraction of a second in order to get you know, one one twenty fifth of a second, one sixth of a second. I'm making exposures. Uh, I have made exposures up to almost an hour. Test exposures to try and figure out what's going on. So sort of recording. 
Well, but if you're moving around in the picture, you're not, you know, you're not sitting still. You're moving around. You're not going to be there. You're a ghost. You're gone. Because you're not, because the film, I said, like I said before, is in a reciprocity thing. It takes longer for the information to build up. And because of that period of time, you're not going to be, you're not going to have enough of you, if you're the person, yeah. recorded on the film in order to make, to make an interview. So, yeah. Uh, how are you uh, calculating your uh, experiences? Um, I'll show you. There are all kinds of uh, charts and calculators and things like that available uh, to use. Uh, and what I've read, I talked to Eric Rainer, who is like the godfather of the of pinhole photography, and I gave him a call, and I said, hey, what's going on with this? You know, Because every time I get some information, everybody's different. Somebody gives me something different each time, so I'm confused. So we're on the phone for about 45 minutes. Uh, I'll pass this around to people. Think, I'm in the process of revising this. But this is one of the calculators that's available um, that you can use. Ilfred has come out with a very new Harman uh, uh, Titan camera, and they have a, on their website, they have a calculator as well. Uh, so when I go out the photograph, you can calculate exposures according to the lighting situation, whether you want to work in daylight or, 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 or dust, or you can uh, Use a, a standard calculator like that, and decide. I think there's. A, I think originally there was like 150 different formulas for pinhole lenses and and making exposure calculations. Now it's maybe down to like 50, and then there's four or five that are regularly used. I could be incorrect with that, but but uh, when I read, you know, I should be paying more attention to uh, algebra and trigonometry and all the things in school when I was there. But I wasn't, so uh, now I'm, I'm paying for that. Uh, when you go to decide for uh, an exposure, normally what you would do is you, you take along your digital camera or a separate handheld light meter. That's what I do. And um, I'll take a meter reading for 100 ISO. That's the film that I'm using. And I'll set the exposure, say, for instance, 22. If you look at that dial that's going around, there's a uh, there's an f-stops and then there's uh, exposure times. So I'll match the exposure time or the f-stop of the exposure time for my handheld meter. And then I will find on that calculator the f-stop of this pinhole uh, and make the adjustment from there. So if it says to me it's a 15th of a second of the f-22 is going to wind up being you know, 8, 10, 12 seconds with, with a, a 310, with a 310 f-stop on, on this list. So that's how I, I calculate. Questions? More questions? Yes. I took a few of these recently right before this uh, show, and I found it was extremely sensitive to the sun's angle. If yes. the sun was at your back and you moved uh, 10 to 15 degrees, you could, you'd probably drop a, a stop in the exposure. Well, that's sensitive. Yes. Well, I always wait to the actual very last second uh, before. That's the, the, the exposure calculation is the actual last thing I do before I make the exposure, because of some of the things that you talked about. Um, one of the things I found too, and, and again I read about this and it seems to be true, is that the closer you get to a subject, the sharper it seems to get. The farther away you are from the subject, then there's a chance for it to be softened. Not loss of depth of field, but just soft in appearance. And I read it because of the atmosphere, so that's the things in the atmosphere that have an effect on what's going on. Now, these pictures were taken at, at uh, around 12,000 feet, 11,000 feet up in Santa Fe. Okay, so there, is the, the sky is a, is a lot thinner, and I, I had to avenge this, but you can see with some of them where, and, and they've been sharpened, but they been, haven't been over sharpened in any other way that I wouldn't do normally with any image in Photoshop, because you have to correct for that uh, because of the scanning process. So there's no, uh, there's no uh, over exhilaration something. I will say, that uh, I don't use, for those people who work in Photoshop, I don't use unsharp mask as a sharpening device. I use what is known as uh, high pass sharpening. And it's a, it's a technique that allows me to sharpen the images with the least amount of damage to them, the least amount of noise, um, and the least amount of increase in contrast. So you, there are all sorts of uh, uh, tutorials on the web that you can just, just type in high pass, uh, sharpening, uh, and there's a couple of deep tutorials on YouTube that'll show you how to do this, and you'll be ready to go back. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, you do need visual. Well, um, I'm working with a student right now that is doing doing that. Uh, no, I mean this, I got my hands full uh, with this, but I do have a couple students in my class. As a matter of fact, that I've ordered, I told about Linux and they have ordered pinholes. And so uh, I'm working with them in the class. And so I'm learning through them what, what they're doing and not doing and all. And I'm seeing some, some very interesting results uh, from what uh, they use with their cameras. So, uh, uh, they, are they working with extenders or what is this? Well, uh, one of my students does have a set of extenders. And uh, I just uh, copied and I gave Joe and uh, Rachel some information about uh, the use of extenders. There is an article in uh, Landscape Photography UK, uh, the recent one that was out that had an article on pinhole photography. For those of you who can pick that up, I don't know if it's on the web yet, but if you go to Barnes and Noble's bookstore, you can be able to find it. It's in their master classes section. And uh, they talked about pinhole photography and being able to extend the focal lens using extension tubes. And uh, I was here a week ago and we were working with some uh, bellows. So that's another idea that uh, Joe and company are, are working on that might, uh, might also aid with that. But there are specific focal lens and matching pinholes to go with that if you have extension tubes. What was the mm -hmm. size one? I'm sorry. I'm sorry? You, you mentioned the article. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's uh, Master classes is the, the magazine is uh, uh, landscape photography UK. It's a very high quality, high processed, uh, you know, very nice, nice printing process. I think it costs probably about eleven to twelve dollars. Yeah, uh, and it's from the UK. UK and uh, in the in the back of the magazine they have what is called master classes. And in their master class section, there was an article about uh, pinhole photography using digital cameras, and that's where they talked about the different focal lengths and sensor tubes and all that kind of stuff. So I copied that information quickly and passed it on this book. Any guess whether the extenders might be a problem and maybe something like what would come out of the large format camera? Well, the, you know, again, these were shot with, with this. So I had no controls of swings of tilts or anything. Well, yeah, I just meant through a through a larger through, film. Through, through a big. Well, that would be interesting long, to see. Long, I, it would depend on whether you, I guess, whether you had a crop sensor or not have a crop sensor, whether you have a full sensor. Uh, that's another whole issue within itself. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm working with students with that right now. I find that probably do you have do you have a full sensor camera? You find it. No, I, I like the full sensor camera because I actually I like, um, unlike you, it's kind of nice that it would look so on work because I want my pinhole stuff to look kind of pinhole. Right. right. Your stuff looks amazing. <laughs> I was actually going to ask you if you, do you still, is uh, HP5 available in 5.7? Yes. In the sheets? Yes. Um, yes. Have you tested that against uh, the, uh, the T-Max? No, I've not tested this against T-Max, but I, but I have tested uh, not in 5.7, but 4.5, uh, FP4. The reason that I use the slower speeds is because uh, I'm concerned about when I when I go to work on it, sure. I want the grain, I want you know less noise and sure. as tight an image as I possibly can get mm -hmm. to, to do that. So I try to keep the, and I notice that with scanning, uh, it seems like the higher ISO, the more noise that you'll get. And that's how I, I kind of back away from that. Except the F H HP5 is supposed to have some characteristics that prevents that from happening. Yeah, it's also got, it's, it's, the red sensitivity is a little bit higher. Right. So when I was looking at, I was actually trying to figure out what the doc, and I thought you were using the HP5, because you do get wonderful, when you have real clean blue skies, you get automatically a little bit of a filter. Right. Now this is, uh, this is T-Max, T-Max 100. And I'm but in terms to of, uh, to really answer your question though, is, um, and you'll see in the stuff that I'm going to show, I think, um, shortly, that this, I'm going, I want pinhole stuff to look pinhole. Um, when I first started testing pinhole, I can't remember whose I bought, but I bought one and I just, it looked horrible. Um, and I put it away. <laughs> no, it wasn't yours. Um, and it just looked, you know, it was kind of like, you, you know, like a holder with the lens on and just, it, it didn't look, it didn't look special and unique at all. Right, right. And um, <coughs> I was playing with stuff and I, um, I was playing with film speeds and there's a couple shots in that I use, I'm using a, a uh, 5D Mark II that I'm using at 6400. 
and it gives a real um, kind of a textured grain to it. I got prints of those as well. Um, but then you have the convenience of being able to use the SLR. So it's kind of, um, I'm doing it differently to get the, the, the effect and the aesthetic, um, but the convenience of being able to flip it over and, and meter from the piece of history. And that's a, that's a nice thing. I'm going to put it on. That's the nice thing about chemical photography is that there are several, I guess, genres that you can choose where you want to work in. It's a tool. It's a tool. And if you want your images to be soft and, and you like that effect, there, there is room for you and there are techniques that you can refine and, uh, and, and work on to achieve that. If you're a sharp nut like me who's still fascinated by, you know, this hole in a, in a disc, I still can't get over that. I mean, I understand all the science and all that stuff, but you know, there's a hole in here. That's all about the lens. Uh, but, and, and to get this kind of sharp image reproduction with, you know, with all the, without all the fluff and stuff, it's just absolutely fascinating. So you've got, and everything in between. So you've got all this, all these options that you can choose. To work I've seen, I've spent a tremendous amount of time looking at other people's work over the net. And I've seen, you know, a large variety of, of choices and ideas about how people want to present their pinhole photography and in what form, from ultra sharp, like I try to do, to very nice, soft, painful. But, and more well, especially, what was the middle five years at Ants Labs? He said the middle five years is where you are uh, perfecting your craft. Okay, good. Um, you know, the first five years, you're trying to find out where the bells and whistles are, how to turn anything off, how to turn anything on, you know, how to get it around, off and around your neck to take a picture. <laughs> and in the second five years, you start, you start to, you know, you start to get your craft together. You can go into, here's the difference. The difference, I think, for me, especially with the second five years, is that uh, before that, the first time, I would come home and I would hope that everything came out right. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Oh, the film is not exposed. Okay, the second five years when I started to get, I would know that the film was not going to I would know that I've done the best and I've prepared myself in the best possible way to get to make the exposures, to get the, what I wanted to do, to know what developer and what temperature and what time to work with one film that was going to give me the results that I want. So I don't have to, that frees you. It's, a, it's an amazing type of thing. When you don't have to worry about your craft, whether you're doing the right thing or not, uh, you're free to see. And, and that's one of the things I tell students all the time, is that once you get those two things under control, how the camera works and working on your craft, now you're free to see. Because you can't see as long as you turn in the knobs and buttons and whistles and hoping everything comes out. That doesn't happen. You got to be free to see. Do you like to say a little bit about dynamic range? I, I've been enamored with HDR recently, so I want to work with uh, multiple exposures and okay. putting them together. Did you try any of that? Did no, just, no. I've had my hands full just with yeah. just with uh, uh, trying to make sure that I, that I got my craft right. So it's like I could walk away. And, like I said, the first six times I went out it was an absolute disaster. I was overexposed, and you know things went wrong. Was it close enough? I hit the camera. All kinds of crazy things were going on. And Richard, Richard, you got to get your acting out of here. you got to get down to this. So after about this, you know, adjusting to how this would see and, and you know, and adjusting for the calculations, for the, all that, you know, it's incredible. So now I, I could go to New Mexico and take one one shot or something and come back and go, all right, you know. But before, in January, I couldn't do that. February, I couldn't do that. March is when I went away. By the time March came around, I was able to say, okay. I got it. I'm rolling now. I can do this. Okay. I'm sure you'll talk about HDR maybe when you get my man. Do you do it yet? No. no. Yeah, that, I feel like it's a human. I'll talk about game before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, listen, thank yeah, you very much. I've enjoyed it.